Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to gather on this Lord's Day and to open God's Word and see what He has to say to us. And uh, we are in our ninth installment of the Foundations of Faith uh, series that we have been going through. And uh, I hope you have been enjoying it as much as I have to just know what we stand on. Our, our faith is a sure faith. Uh, it's a rock and uh, it's what we can base our lives and our worldview on and we can trust that it is sure, especially in the times we live in when it's difficult to know what is true, what is right and wrong. So this morning we are going to look at the end, last things, things that are to come, which I have called it the foundations for the future. So before we begin, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, again, we thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the fellowship uh, that we have because of your Holy Spirit who binds us together. And uh, Lord, even in a, a, a challenging time with this pandemic to where we are not able uh, to gather in the same room as yet, uh, Lord, we um, thank you for this technology. Lord, people are getting saved. People are coming to know the Savior. People are growing in their faith and trust in you. And Lord, we thank you for the church at large where you are removing idols out of our lives, taking things out of the way so we would see you very clearly. So Lord, I ask for your help, your Holy Spirit, to uh, help me to help my friends and family here at Crossway Menifee uh, to know who you are and how you are going to wrap all things up. And so, again, we praise you. Again, we thank you. And you, we give you all the glory for your so deserving. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I would like to start by reading from 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'd like to read through the first 14 verses of chapter 3 of Peter, who was one of the original 12 disciples. And as he writes this letter to the churches that are at, are at large at that time, this is what he says. He says, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am steering, stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Verse 6. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished, speaking of the time of Noah. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept 
until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, and here it is, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. In my study this week, I ran across uh, this list, this article, and this was the title at the top of the page, The Top Nine Ways to Know If You Are Obsessed with Prophecy. Here's the first one. You always leave the top down on your convertible in case the rapture happens. Second, you don't buy green bananas. Third, you talk your church into adapting the 60s pop song, Up, Up and Away, remember that song? As a Christian hymn. Fourthly, Barcode scanners make you nervous. Fifth, you refuse a tax refund check because the amount comes to $666. Sixth, you can name more signs of the times than you can commandments. Seventh, You believe the term church fathers refers to Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye. Eight, you get goosebumps when you hear a trumpet. I I do that. That happens to me. I get all excited thinking, he's coming back. He's coming right now. And then ninth and lastly, you use the left behind books as devotional reading. Now, I would not say that I am obsessed with Bible prophecy, but I am certainly interested in the end times because the Bible is a book of prophecy. And so much of the Bible is prophecy that I say I love prophecy because I love God's word. I love the Bible. And studying the end times has helped me more than anything else to understand the whole Bible. You see, one of the primary reasons the average Christian avoids studying Bible prophecy is all of the different views. You see, a person can pick up a few books and brush up on his or her knowledge of the end times, and soon he or she is hopelessly lost with lengthy explanations of long, unfamiliar words. Have you ever been there? It kind of reminded me of a story of a little boy whose father was a preacher, and after hearing his dad preach on justification 
and sanctification and all the other Asians. He was ready when his Sunday school teacher asked if he knew what uh, procrastination meant. And the boy immediately replied, I'm not sure what it means, but I know our church believes in it. <laughs> Don't you love that? But that's how many people are when it comes to Bible prophecy. They're not sure what these big words mean, but they know that it's something that they must believe in. So I have a question. What should Christians be doing to get ready for the cataclysmic events preceding the end of the age and the second coming of Christ? And that's what I hope this study will help you. See, given the, the current state of affairs in, in our world, in our country, in our state, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the Lord may be returning soon. And I know that my confidence is in God, and I live by faith. But some of my Christian friends and family and relatives tell me that's not enough. Some of them are selling their homes, moving to remote desert or mountain locations, stockpiling food and buying weapons and ammunition, and the list goes on and on. Well, is this the right thing to do? Are we really supposed to run and hide as these things get worse? Or should we stay where we are and continue to minister to the people that are around us. Well, the Bible clearly instructs us to be sober-minded and vigilant. And the Bible also teaches that no one can say for certain that we are living in the end times. Jesus himself repeatedly say that no one knows or can know the day or the hour of his return. However, we are to discern the signs of the times and the end of the age. In fact, Jesus called these things birth pangs. Listen to what he said in Luke's gospel in, in chapter 21 when he said, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That's how we're supposed to respond. We are expectant. He is coming soon. And while we wait for him to return, we need to redeem the time that we have left. To be sure, we are surrounded by events and developments that could be interpreted as the signs of the end. We certainly see famines, earthquakes, pandemic, pestilence, disasters, troubles, persecutions, wars, and rumors of wars that Jesus talked about in Mark chapter 13. But has there ever been a period in the history of the world when this wasn't the case? Can you imagine what it was like to be a believer in Rome under Emperor Nero or Domitian? To face the arena, the stake, or the lion's den for your faith? What do you suppose Christians were thinking when the Roman legions captured Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in AD 70? Or when Attila the Hun overran Europe in the 5th century, the Vikings in the 9th century, Genghis Khan in the 13th century, the Muslim Turks in the 16th century? 
fact, many would have concluded that the end was near when the Black Death, the bubonic plague, wiped out entire towns and claimed more than 25 million lives between 1347 and 1352. And how did the situation look to believers at the beginning of the last century when the so-called Great War destroyed the flower of an entire generation, 37 million casualties? And in the last century, just a few decades later, when the shadow of Hitler in the Third Reich was rising over Germany and Eastern Europe. Well, clearly, as we live in the early 21st century, we have had our share of death, disaster, devastation, and terror. In fact, you don't need to know a great deal about history to realize this. But let's assume for a moment that these are the end times. What then? How should a Christian respond? Well, fortunately, the Apostle Peter gives us a straightforward answer to these questions. Peter does not suggest that believers head for the hills or start stockpiling food and weapons. Instead, he advises and encourages believers. Look at verse 10 again. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening to the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. As Peter sees it, Nearly 2,000 years ago, end-time Christians are called to do one thing. They are to practice holiness and godliness as we wait for the Lord's return. We are supposed to work the works of God while it is still day, as Jesus said in John 9. And Paul seems to have been thinking the same way when he wrote the book of Galatians, when he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So this morning... This is what I would like to do with the rest of our time that we have together is to give you a timeline of the last days and explain some key uh, phrases and terms along the way. And that will help us to understand the future. So my first question this morning is, can we really understand Bible prophecy? Simply put, Bible prophecy is God revealing history in advance. Prophecies are divinely inspired revelations given by God through a person. Prophecies were given as predictions, warnings, and directives for taking action. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, God is calling his people back to Himself, And then as you transition into the New Testament and the Savior is revealed, it's all talking about how we get along and, and until God wraps everything up in the book of Revelation. In the New Testament, Peter tells us how these prophecies were given. He said, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along or inspired by the Holy Spirit. So this isn't something that some guy made up. 
right? This is what God divinely inspired by his Holy Spirit. Why we see God's word is inspired. And the things that he say, says that are going to come to pass, you can bank on it. Because he's had so many fulfilled prophecies up to this point. So the end time things that he speaks about will come to pass as well. Well, the technical term for the study of end time Bible prophecy is the word eschatology. And eschatology means the study of last things. Uh, Miriam Webster's dictionary defines it as a branch of the theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world or of human kind. Eschatology touches all other key areas of systematic biblical study. Genesis, at the very beginning, the first book of the Bible, it introduces key themes that are progressively revealed in later books. And these themes find their final resolution in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation which is distinct, the, the, the distinction and the last prophetic book of the Bible. Remember this, the Bible was written by 40 different authors, which was written over a period of about 1,500 years. The Bible was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was also written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Yet the Bible is one complete story beginning with eternity past and ending with eternity future. Wow, it is a supernatural book. Now, there are several important aspects of Bible prophecy that can help you gain a better understanding of it and how it relates to your life. And unlike the vague predictions of modern day psychics and palm readers, Bible prophecies are specific predictions of future events given through God's appointed prophets. And you might remember from Deuteronomy chapter 13 that the main test of a true prophet is that their predictions must come true a hundred percent of the time a second important test of a prophet is that their prophecies must agree with scripture and not cause anyone to worship false gods you can check that out for yourself in deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 4 but another important aspect of prophecy is that it displays the character and nature of god Through the prophets, God made it clear that only he can appoint and predict future events. In essence, God ties his own credibility and character to the accuracy of Bible prophecy. That is why he says through the prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. You see what he's doing? He's he's proving that he is God. And Bible prophecy shows us that indeed. And then finally... To understand Bible prophecy, you must understand the language of prophecy. This is where it can get tangled up, and there's these terms and these, uh, you know, amillennial and premillennial and postmillennial. There's all these long, big theological words. But once you correctly understand basic prophecy terms, you will have a firm footing for your understanding of Bible prophecy. Don't, so don't be scared of it. We should dive into it. And you will move from confusion and ambiguity to a clear understanding of the uh, key components of Bible prophecy. 
So to help you understand some of the foundations of the future, I'm going to take you now through an end times timeline. And we will also come across some key terms and phrases that will give you a better understanding of end times prophecy. So what is the end times timeline? Well, here at Crossway Menifee, we have and take a pre-tribulational approach to eschatology. eschatology. And there are other views, and, and you can check those out, but we take, it, uh, take the Bible and the end times from this perspective, from a futuristic, literal view. So we're premillennial and pre-tribulational, and that is how I am going to present this timeline to you this morning. Now, this is going to be a lightning round, much like Joey did last week with the armor of God. So we're going to go over quickly. These are places and there'll be verses on the screen that you can look at and write those things down so you can check them out later on your own. So number one on the end times timeline is the rapture of the church. This is when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds to snatch away all those who trust in him. And at this time, the dead in Christ will be resurrected and taken to heaven too. And from our perspective today, this is the next event on the timeline. This is what's next on the calendar. So the rapture is imminent and no other biblical prophecy needs to be fulfilled, fulfilled before the rapture happens. Now, this is something to keep in mind because this is where it can get a little confusing. The rapture and the second coming of Christ, they're two separate events. And sometimes it's difficult to determine whether a passage of scripture is referring to the rapture or the second coming. So in studying end times prophecy, it is very important to differentiate between the two. The rapture is when Jesus Christ comes to remove the church, all believers in Christ, from the earth. The rapture is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 54. So believers who have died will have their bodies resurrected. Now, those believers who died are absent from the body and present with the Lord, but also the believers who are alive and remain on the earth at that time will meet the Lord in the air. And this will all occur in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye. The second coming is when Jesus returns to defeat the Antichrist, destroy evil, and establish a millennial kingdom. The second coming of Jesus is described in detail in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. So the rapture and the second coming are similar but separate events. Both involve Jesus returning, both are end times events, and it's important to recognize the differences. So in summary, our first point, the rapture is the return of Christ in the clouds to remove all believers from the earth before the time of God's wrath, the tribulation. The second coming is the return of Christ to the earth to bring the tribulation to an end and to defeat the Antichrist and his evil world empire. So first of all, on the calendar, on the timeline, we have the rapture of the church. Secondly, we have the rise of the Antichrist. So after the church is taken out of the way, a satanically empowered man will gain worldwide control with promises of peace. You see that in Revelation 13 and also in Daniel chapter 9. He will be aided by another man called the false prophet. 
who heads up a religious system that requires worship of the Antichrist. And you can read about him in Revelation 19. So the next event on the end times timeline is the tribulation. Now the tribulation, sometimes referred to in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble, is a period of seven years in which God's judgment is poured out on sinful humanity. You see that in Revelation chapter 6 through 18, those chapters. The Antichrist rises to power and is associated with this time period. And during the tribulation on the earth, the church will be in heaven. Remember point one on the timeline? The rapture has already taken place. So the church is already in heaven. And it is thought at this time, this is when the marriage supper of the Lamb occurs in heaven. So the tribulation refers to a full seven-year period, while the great tribulation refers to the second half of the tribulation, the last three and a half years. This is where we see the bowl judgments, where God's wrath is poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. The book of Revelation gives us more information about uh, uh, this, this great tribulation this last three and a half years. So from Revelation 13... When the beast is revealed until Christ returns in, in Revelation 19, we are given a picture of God's wrath on the earth because of unbelief and rebellion. The next thing on the timeline is the battle of Gog and Magog. And you can read more about this in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. So briefly, in the first part of the tribulation... A great army from the north in alliance with several other countries from the Middle East and Africa attacks Israel and is defeated by God's supernatural intervention. Now some commentators place this battle just before the start of the tribulation. Fifthly on the timeline is the abomination of desolation. We saw uh, and, and studied this when we were in the book of Daniel. In fact, I would encourage you to go to our church website and click on the sermons tab and look at uh, chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12. But in Daniel 12, in Mark 13, in Revelation chapter 12, at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and shows his true colors. And the Jews are scattered, and many of them during that time turn to the Lord. They are able to look on him whom they pierce, like as the book of Zechariah talks about, and they realize that Jesus Christ is their promised Messiah. A great persecution takes place and breaks out against all those who believe in Christ. After the abomination of desolation, we have the battle of Armageddon. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns with the armies of heaven. He saves Jerusalem from annihilation and defeats the armies of the nations fighting under the banner of the Antichrist. The Antichrist and the false prophet are captured and thrown alive into the lake of fire. Woohoo! Can't wait. For that to take place. After that comes the judgment of nations. This is when Jesus will judge the survivors of the tribulation, separating the righteous from the wicked as sheep and the goats. The righteous will enter into the millennial kingdom. The wicked will be cast in to hell. And then what happens next, we read about in Revelation chapter 20, is the binding of Satan. Satan will be bound and held in a bottomless pit for the next 1,000 years. Woohoo! Not yet. He's not, it's not time to say woohoo yet. That's coming in just a minute. But ninthly, we have the millennial kingdom. And the millennial kingdom is the title given to the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Jesus himself will rule the world, and Jerusalem will be its capital. 
And this will be a thousand year period of peace and prosperity on the earth with Jesus ruling and reigning. Now there are some who seek to interpret this thousand years, this millennium in an allegorical manner. Uh, the uh, amillennial, amillennialism is the name given to the belief that there will not be a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth. The people who hold this belief are called all millennialists. And the, and the prefix a in amillennialism means no or not. So amillennialism means no millennium. Now this differs from the most widely accepted and our accepted view here at Crossway Menifee called premillennialism. And also it's different from the less widely accepted view called postmillennialism. Postmillennialists believe that Christ will return after Christians have established the kingdom on the earth. But in fairness to amillennialists, they do not believe that there's no millennial at all. They just think it's a figurative way to mean a long period of time. However, as we take the Bible literally, six times in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7, the millennial kingdom is specifically said to be a thousand years in length. And if God wanted to communicate a long period of time, he could have done that. But that being said, the fulfillment of many of God's covenants and promises rests on this literal, physical, future kingdom. Number 10, we get to the last battle. So at the end of the millennium, at the end of this thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison for a short time. He will deceive the nations once again, and there will be a rebellion against the Lord that will be quickly defeated. In fact, Jesus just speaks a word and it's over. Satan will be cast forever and ever into the lake of fire, never to deceive or reappear ever again. So now you can say it. Woohoo, right? I cannot wait until that takes place when sin is gone because the author of sin and the lie, the father of lies is cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And then there's two more events that take place in, in the end times when God's wrapping everything up. Number 11 is the great white throne judgment. Now, this is for all those who are being held in hell. They will be brought forth. And all the wicked from all eras of history will be resurrected to stand before God in the final judgment. The verdicts are read and all of sinful humanity who have rejected Christ's offer of forgiveness are cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. We want to be at the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. Believers do not partake in the great white throne judgment because we're in Christ. Last and most importantly, and boy, every time I step on a goat head, every time I see a tumbleweed roll around in front of our house, we have a new creation that the Bible talks about, and that's in chapters 21 and 22. You need encouragement today? Read Revelation chapter 21 and 22 this afternoon. This is when God will completely remake the heavens and the earth, and it is at this time that God wipes away all tears, and there will be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow. The new Jerusalem descends from heaven and the children of God will enjoy eternity with him in heaven. And I'm tempted to talk more about heaven, but Dennis is going to handle that subject next week. He's going to talk about heaven and hell next week. So encourage you to either watch online or wherever we may be meeting to, to be able to hear that message because it's really important. So, 
I would like to take the rest of our time that we have to close with some points of application. And uh, these are how does the end times and how do these things matter for you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the first one is, is Bible prophecy relevant for us today? Indeed, the answer is yes. Fulfilled Bible prophecy is one of the most compelling evidences that the Bible is inspired by God, that there is a God. Major historical events were told centuries and in some cases thousands of years in advance. And these prophecies were fulfilled to the exact detail. No other document in the world can make this claim. The only logical explanation is that this book is supernatural in nature. You see, I can't show God to you, but I can show you his fingerprints all over fulfilled prophecy. God never expected us to check our brains at the door as we consider the claims of Scripture. For those sincerely seeking patterns of evidence in God's word, I believe these patterns, if you take the time, God will lead you to himself. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, fulfilled Bible prophecy demonstrates God's faithfulness. He's a promise keeper. Let me say that again. Fulfilled Bible prophecy demonstrates God's faithfulness that he is a promise keeper. Next, why is the world so crazy right now? Boy, I can tell you in my life here on this earth, I, I've never experienced what we're going through right now. And there's so much craziness. And, and we have, uh, even in, in my grandparents' lifetime, they experienced and got to see the reestablishment of, of Israel as a nation once again, which starts to line everything up. All the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are being put together because of the world events that God had predicted through Ezekiel and Isaiah in, in, in the past, Zechariah in the past. But many prophecy experts and students have noted that prophetic developments have increased significantly over the past decade, and I would uh, agree. I remember when I first came to Christ 25 years ago, and, and I, the first time I, I had a little bit of an understanding on the book of Revelation, and, and I remember, oh, oh that's got to be years and years off. And then just in the last 10, you just go, wow. It is all playing out. You can see as soon as the restrainer is removed, as soon as the believers are taken out, how it will become hell on earth. But have you also noticed there is a recent obsession with, with uh, apocalyptic themes and storylines? It seems every few months there's a new TV movie or show or video game with some type of end of the world scenario that's released. Why is this? Could it be? As the Bible said, God has placed eternity in every single person's heart. That doesn't mean that every person is saved, but everybody knows that there is a God. Could it be that we intuitively know that history is heading towards a conclusion? If you and I believe scripture, then we can't ignore the fact that Jesus instructed us to look for the convergence of the end time signs, which will indicate that his return will happen very soon. In fact, in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, Jesus said, when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This is a time for us to be alert, 
to be sober-minded, to be expectant. And we dare not set a date or a time frame, but it is biblical for us to look for and know the season of his return. And it seems we are closer than to that season that many, than many people realize. We, we know that Jesus said that no one knows the day of the hour, but we are to know the season of his return. So as the closer uh, it comes of his return and, and his re, uh, return appears, the stronger our desire should, should be to live for him. And the more boldly we should share our faith. Believe me, right? Believe you and me. I know if we sat around in a circle, it can be overwhelming and a bit scary to ponder the last days. But remember that our redemption is drawing near. No more tears. The former things will be passed away. If you haven't already, I want to invite you to make an all-important first step by accepting Jesus' gift of salvation and begin a personal relationship with him today. You see, the safest place to be is not a place. It's a person. A person who loved you, who loves you, and loves you so much that he took God's wrath that was deserved for you and me upon himself and hung on a wooden cross and died for your sins and my sins and is resurrected from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God and is coming again very soon. Lastly, how are we to live our lives in light of Christ's return? We, we believe that the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. His return could occur at any moment. With the Apostle Paul, we look for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Knowing that the Lord could come back today, uh, some may be tempted to stop what they're doing and just wait for him, right? Stockpile the food in the garage. Get that shotgun ready so we can hang in there until Jesus comes back. And I think even in this time, it's very difficult because we can get so caught up in the news and the perceived signs and miss the Savior and what he's called us to do. There is a big difference between knowing that Jesus could return today and knowing that he will return today. The time of his coming is something God has not revealed to anyone. And so until he calls us to himself, we should continue serving him. Remember Jesus' parable of the ten talents. The departing king instructs his servants to occupy until I come, until I return. The return of Christ is always presented in Scripture as a great motivation to action, not as a reason to cease from action. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, when Jesus is ascending up into heaven and, and the disciples are watching him ascend up into the clouds, this is what Luke writes that they said or what took place. They, these angels, say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going in to heaven. He went up in a cloud. He's coming back with a cloud. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul wraps up his teaching on the rapture by saying, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul concludes a lesson on Christ's coming with these words. So then, let us not be like others 
who are asleep, dead, but let us be alert and self-control. For us to retreat or to try to hold the fort was never Jesus' intention for us. Instead, we work while we can. Jesus said, night is coming when no one can work. This is how the apostles lived their lives. They lived and served with the idea that Jesus could return within their lifetimes. And when you think about it, what if they would have ceased from their labors and just hid out in the uh, upper room and just, and just waited? They would have been disobedient to Christ's command to go into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. See, the apostles understood that Jesus' imminent return meant that they must busy themselves in God's work. They lived life to the fullest as if every day was their last. Oh, church. Ah. We just have so many ties to this world. Man, I am guilty of it. I, I like some of the things that I have. I love my wife. I love my family. I, I love my church family as well. And, 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 and sometimes I just, Lord, just keep it comfortable until Jesus comes back, right? I don't know if you're feeling that way, but things are not the same these last five months, are they? And it's causing me to draw even closer it's causing me to live my life as if it was my last days that I have left here. At the very end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says this, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Church, he's coming quickly. Once end times events, when the rapture takes place and those things are put into motion, they will occur in rapid fire succession. The 2,000 years of waiting will end abruptly as events quickly take place beginning with the rapture. The church known as the Bride of Christ will be whisked away and given her rewards. We should view every day as a gift and use it to glorify God. If you are like, you, like me, you have been wounded. You have fought some tough battles. You have had some hard things occur in your life. You have failed at times and had to turn to the Lord for forgiveness You've persevered through times of loneliness, despair, and hardship. But guess what? You are a victorious overcomer. We are overcomers because Christ has overcome. The Lord knows every detail of what has happened to you. And when you see him to face, face to face, it will all make sense. My prayer is that you will gain spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear. That your heart would be quickened. Your heart be, uh, would just be quickened as we watch and wait for his soon return. May we have the courage to give it everything we got until the final trumpet is blown. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your kindness that has been demonstrated towards us. It's your kindness that leads to repentance. And so, Lord, uh, in light of these things, I pray that those that may be watching um, who have not trusted in you by faith, Lord, would surrender their lives to you. Lord, I, I want to pray so boldly that you would make their life so uncomfortable that they would turn to you.
God, you use difficult things and struggles and trials to draw us closer to yourself. Lord, I pray that the church of Jesus Christ that is living on this planet at this very time and at this very moment, as it seems we are indeed in the last days, we are, certain close, we are certainly closer than when we first begun. God, I ask that you would strengthen us, you would encourage us, help us to be immovable, steadfast, abounding in the work of the Lord because we know that those labors will not be in vain because they're all for your glory. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us. Thank you for telling us how it all ends. And someday we will indeed live happily ever after. Until that day, we will praise you. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you stand up? Pastor Joe's going to lead us in one last song. God bless you.